I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, in China, though, um, Joseph Needham, who is the greatest historian on Chinese history, he wrote seven volumes of Chinese history. He himself said that there was a theological orientation of the Chinese that was the decisive factor that blocked them from having modern science, from developing modern science. They, they didn't discover the scientific method because they, their religion focuses them um, from the mind, on your mind. The success in Taoism is to merge into the rhythm of the cosmic cycles in your mind. Um, and here's a, a quote from Chuang Tzu. Um, men who study the Tao do not follow on when these operations end, nor try to search out how they begin. That they're not interested in the things of the external world. And this is um, one of the Upanishads from India. And you can see the psychological impact here. I'm like a frog in a well. I, I'm born into the cycle that I'm in. It, there's a hopelessness. Um, and, they, and their religious outlook was to um, this first principle, the soul of the universe. You see the pantheism there. And I just I picked one quote from each one, but there's many, many more. Um, the Enuma Elish was a portrayal of personified forces, bloody battles coming from a body. There was a body that was murdered by the children, and it became the sky, the earth, the waters, and the air. But such a cosmogony is not conducive to developing science in the definition of, and it's probably a good time to define what, it, what do we mean by modern science, what's modern compared to ancient. It's a quantification of nature. It's not just one quantification, it's a development of physical laws and systems of physical laws that is an effort to understand how nature works. Um, and, and it's just not conducive to doing that if you have this pantheistic outlook. And then there's Greece. That's always the one that comes up is what about the Greeks? Because you're probably wondering, did she miss the Greeks? <laughs> the Greeks, and, and people have, our atheist scholars have argued with me on this one the most. Um, but there, I mean, there was a long span of time of the Greeks. Like I, you would have to have a whole lecture series on that. The Greeks came closer than anybody else. They almost developed modern science. There was so much there, um, which is just further testament to why couldn't they just get there? Why couldn't they break through to this system of physical laws? And it was because of, and this could be argued, I'm not going to say I actually know what every one of them was thinking, but in their writings, you do see the pantheism. Even when they were trying to be systematic, even when they were trying to make measurements, you see the influence of pantheism, the stranglehold of pantheism. But of course, we can't mention the Greeks without mentioning some of the great scholars through time, okay, through over like a thousand period of years or more. But you can't think about science without thinking of Pythagoras or Democritus with, with the atoms and Hippocrates in medicine, and Euclid, and Plato, and Socrates, and of course Aristotle, um, and many, many, many more. They, without what they did, modern science wouldn't have been born in the Christian West. Their contribution was critical. It, they had to do what they did. They are part of the story. They're part of the story of Christianity too, right? Hellenistic culture, um, they Christianized it, it's the same thing. It, they had their thought um, was completely appreciated by the Middle Age scholars who come through their work. It's just that they rejected what contradicted Christian tenets, namely an eternally cycling universe. And you can see, um, I, I darkened some points and left some of it light just to draw attention so you're not trying to read through everything. Um, but you can see this is from Aristotle and on the heavens. And notice that last sentence. So, you know, he's saying up at the top that he knows this. What, what does St. Thomas say in the beginning of the Summa Theologiae? He says awkward things happen when you don't start your reasoning from divine revelation. If you're just reasoning and reasoning on your own, um, you can get led astray. But Aristotle was saying, and he was saying that because he had read Aristotle, right? 
Aristotle was saying that just from observation, we see that the heavens never change in our lives. We see that they're cyclical. It's reasonable for us to conclude that there is an eternally cycling cosmos. Um, but notice that even Aristotle figured out the psychological impact. The same ideas one must believe, he, he followed his logic to the conclusion, must recur in men's minds not once or twice, but over and over and over again. So even if you're having these brilliant new ideas, it's happened before, it's going to happen again forever. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, it's not really the sense of progress that you need. There was also the idea of the great year. Um, that th this had an enormous impact on their thinking, but the great year was part of pantheism. It was part of the cycling cosmos. Um, it was this belief that every certain period that all the celestial bodies would line up to be this golden era, and then it would start over again, and everything would be unaligned, and then it would come back around, and they spent a great deal of time trying to figure out how long that one cycle was. That was the great year. Um, there were two kinds of bodies, terrestrial and celestial. And so the celestial bodies moved. Aristotle had his hypothesis about motion, so it's important that we talk about what makes things move. In the celestial realm, the mover, you always, according to Aristotle, you had to have a mover constantly moving things. If the mover wasn't moving it, it stopped moving. This is how he got to the first mover. But in the celestial realm, there was the ether, and the celestial bodies moved in perfect circles because they were in contact with the divine ether. But the way the ether moved them is this anti-peristasis. Sounds like my name, Stacy. <laughs> this anti-peristasis. The, the, the bodies have to part the medium, and then the medium has to flow in behind them, and that pushes them. So anti, a resistance, peri, a separating, stasis, an equilibrium reached where the body is moving, but it's the medium that's moving it. And it's perfectly in circles because that's the divine medium. And those bodies are at perfect rest, they're happy doing their circle thing, and that's how it goes forever. On Earth, the medium is air or water. And so he explained projectile motion, if you threw a ball, that things on Earth want to be in their resting place. They'll fall to the ground. If you push them with your hand, you're moving it, until you let go, and then the air is moving it, but it's going to also be seeking the horizontal and the vertical motion going down. You have projectile motion. But this is what so Aristotle said that everything has a soul, and the bigger something is, the more desire its soul has to be in its resting place. And this is what led him to conclude falsely that if you have one stone that's ten times the size of another stone and you let go, which one hits the ground first? We know they both hit the ground at the same time. But he concluded the heavier one with the more desire would hit the ground first. And Christian scholars at some point are like, how come nobody ever just did that and figured it out? <laughs> that it's not like that. Um, it, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But this was one consequence that has to do with motion, where this pantheistic outlook really messed up things. Um, and it came from this great year idea. Here is some from Plato. Um, and you see here, he was the one that talked about the great year so much. Um, from the Republic, a cycle or perfect year at the completion of which everything meets and coincides. And then to this end, the stars came into being that created heaven might imitate the eternal nature. You see the pantheism there. He mentions something called a a monogenes, uh, only begotten, but he's not talking about only begotten the way we're used to it. He's talking about only begotten heavens, the only begotten universe. Um, and he mentions it twice. You see it at the end of both of these passages. Um, there's the only begotten heaven created, the only begotten heaven. So again, it's radically different from what Christianity taught. The biblical worldview, and I know for myself, I did not have an appreciation for how radical it must have been to read Genesis back in the day. But it's Genesis is all about God created everything in the beginning from nothing, and God holds everything in existence. Parse it out with evolution however you want. That's the main thing that, that Genesis is teaching there. 
The Israelites knew they had to trust the faithfulness of God. When they look at the circularity of the sky and the seasons and the cycles in our bodies and the cycle of life, they saw that as the faithfulness of God. God has created an ordered world. And we will trust his moral laws. We'll trust the Ten Commandments. We'll follow them, just like the Jewish mother did in 2 Maccabees. And they were inspired. I mean, the mother in 2 Maccabees looked out at God's handiwork and said, if he can do all of this, and he, can, and he can make us, then it's going to be okay. Follow his laws and it's going to be okay in the end. She had that faith. I mean, sometimes I think we, I would just love to meet her and show her the periodic table and explain quantum mechanics to her. Because to be able to do that, you know, to, to explain to her, you haven't seen anything yet until you come and understand what happens with atoms and electrons and, and all those other particles. Um, but this is a radically different view we get back to the refreshing words of the Old Testament. Who was it measured out waters in his open hand, heaven balanced on his palm, earth's mass poised on three of his fingers? In the beginning founded the earth. Heavens are the works of thy, thy hands. This is, needs to be on every science book. <laughs> the, the, the science is the study of the handiwork of God. And so just to continue on the story, and this is where it's like, I'm going to ask you in a minute, are you convinced yet? <laughs> but church fathers rejected the eternity of the world. And I'm sure many of you in here have read more of it than I have, but I spent some time reading some of the early writings of the church fathers, and that's exactly what they were doing. They wouldn't have any of it. A lot of their writing dealt with the eternity of the world. They absolutely rejected it. They said, no, we don't believe it. They said, we don't believe it because it contradicts Scripture. They said... We don't accept the eternity of the world because it's logically not possible. Change requires time. Only an unchangeable world could be eternal. Unchangeable creation is a contradiction in terms. And so they were reasoning this. This is how they were talking with the Greeks, the Hellenistic cultures. They also saw an impact of free will. If God created us in his image and likeness with free will and intellect, then saying that you're just born into whatever cycle and your thoughts are going to occur again and again with the next person in the next part of the cycle, it kind of defies free will. Like, how do you really have free will to make choices and change the course and set the course of your life and choose good over evil if you're just this cog in the wheel that's happened eternally before? It's, it sort of takes away that responsibility. Um, just some more. So I'm moving up in time now. We're into the second century. You see here that he was saying, the Stoics teach that God shall be resolved into fire, the chaos and the order, um, the great year. But we understand that God, the creator of things, is superior to things that are to be changed. And he also saw in the very last line the impact on free will, intellect, and virtue, on the freedom to choose good over evil. So I'm just putting these up here to show you that there are quotes that support all of this. Um, Athenagoras said that Christians distinguish God from matter. They teach that matter is one thing and God another. Separated by a wide interval, the deity is uncreated and eternal. Matter is created and perishable. An instrument, instrument in tune and well and moving in well measured time. That's language like you hear scientists today speak of. Um, and it's reasonable that matter should be older than God. It is not reasonable, for the efficient cause must of necessity exist before the things that are made. So again, they're defending this, that God created everything out of nothing in the beginning. Clement of Alexandria into the 3rd century, same thing. He was speaking to those cultures. Why do you affect life with idols, imagining winds, air, fire, earth, stock, stones, iron, this world itself to be God's? How great is the power of God, his mere will is creation. So they're defending creation. Let none of you worship the sun, let no one deify the universe. Seek after the creator. Origin, um, second, third century. Uh, he also noticed, I probably shouldn't have liked all that, but he also noticed the impact on freedom of will. He also picked up on the logos. Um, the Greeks thought the Logos was this divine animating principle. What do Christians call the Logos? The Son. 
the second person of the Holy Trinity. St. Augustine up into the, the fourth, fifth century, also things created being different from God, inferior to him, yet good. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created the will of God, the love that's there. God created things good. Um, and he also re recognized that if you say that everything is in a circle going on and on and on and on, eternally cycling, Christianity can't have any of that because it would mean that there were more than one Adam and Eve or more than Christ, most importantly, Christ died and rose for our sins over and over and over and over again. So they absolutely had to reject the concept of the false doctrine of the eternal cycle. Philoponus was one of these that said, who's a convert, as I understand it, in his commentary on the physics, he was like, you know, how come nobody ever dropped the rocks? And he noticed that there, he was starting to change the language instead of the soul and antiperistasis, he's talking about a quantity of motion. And notice, this is long before the scientific revolution. But it's not just a, a certain thing or skill or accomplishment. It's a mental worldview. Then, as the story goes, so we're moving across time really fast here. Then, you know, there's always that gap between, um, like, the 7th century up until into the, the 1100s, 1200s. There was a delay and a detour, so to speak. But we have to bring the Muslim faith into it here. They also made great contributions. They got, just to speak very generally, had the Greek works. The, the monasteries also protected them, but they also went through, the, the um, Arabian cultures were going through the Greek works. There were houses of wisdom erected, Baghdad, Cairo, Cordova, um, in the 800s, 900s. And amassed, they also printed books, amassed over 300,000 volumes and welcomed scholars from the Christian West to come there and study. Okay, that had to happen. That's part of the story too. And there were also great scholars there who invented more things than I can possibly mention going through this, but paper making, they learned from the Chinese art of paper making. Um, they extensively translated and reproduced the Greek literature. Um, there was the works of Galen, um, considered second only to Hippocrates in his works uh, in the medical world. And more, you know, I just want to acknowledge those before I say why science wasn't born there. <laughs> um, because there was a struggle here in these works. When you read what these men were writing, they accepted what Aristotle said. As Father Yaki put it, they couldn't break the stranglehold of pantheism, though. So they do have a monotheism, and they see the world as created by God with a beginning in time. But they don't have the doctrine of the Holy Trinity or the Incarnation. There's no salvation history with Christ. And there was no strong reason to reject the pantheism of the Greek literature. So what you have when you read the works that they have, you had the philosophers saying one thing, I think that we could fit this eternally cycling cosmos into our belief system, and you have the theologians saying, well, God created everything in the beginning. And you, you literally had not a reconciliation of faith and science. You had faith and science not coming together and the philosophers concluded one thing, the theologians concluded another thing, and the philosophers concluded maybe the beginning in time just means the beginning of a new cycle. That, that's basically what all this is saying. Being, they, they rationalized that maybe the beginning in time could be a beginning in, in a new cycle. And there wasn't anything in the religious outlook to refute that strongly. There was no absolute <coughs> refutation of it. Because the beginning in time can be taken for the beginning of a new cycle. But the scholars who visited those lands came back. This is Adelard of Bath talking to his nephew. You can see in this thinking, they're trying to accept the ancient Greek works as much as possible. 
but then reason as far as you can, refer the matter to God.